Okay, we're going to switch gears and go from uh, targeted interventional uh, techniques to uh, this is a pain blocking device. This is intrathecal pain pumps. Um, okay, show of hands, how many people do intrathecal pumps? One, two. Okay. Why not? Why is that the case? It's been around for a long time, and I'm going to show you things that you need to be thinking about. And if you're not doing one of the six things I'm going to mention, you're, you're missing out in terms of intrathecal pumps. So we'll talk a little bit about the inverse pyramid of stomatos. We'll talk about targeted drug delivery. Uh, and we're talking about how to incorporate this into your practice. And then I'd like to spend some time on the economics, which is, of course, next to oxygen, one of the most important things that we do and we have. So typically, this concept, the inverse pyramid of stomatos, has been around. This was published in uh, 2005. And, and most of the interventional techniques uh, in the top of the the pyramid, which is invert, averted, of course, the neuroablation and everything else will be short of a corrective surgery. But what we're trying to do is we're trying to incorporate most of the interventional techniques into the corrective surgery and then incorporate some of the pain blocking devices before you'd ever do chronic uh, systemic narcotics. So my position is that you would never start out, out with, in terms of pain management with narcotics first. You know, these are not designed to be used chronically, except for pump, and they don't do very well in terms of pain control over the course of time. So uh, targeted interventional therapies to target the pain generator, to target the area where the patient hurts. This is, is always starting early, and you can do so with a combination of injections, radiofrequency ablation. Some of the corrective surgeries that we've shown you today include interspinous fusion, interspinous spacers, uh, SI joint fusion, basal nerve ablation, and there's a bunch more. So the corrective surgeries are now, we can encompass those. And then after we failed, we can try things like neuromodulation, uh, peripheral nerve stimulation, and then past that, or maybe even before that in some situation, some circumstances, is targeted drug delivery. And so you start off at the top, you click down, becoming a little bit more invasive, a little bit more definitive for the most part, until you stop at the combination of the least invasive thing that helps your patient. And this is uh, the philosophy, this is the ethos by which I do my practice. So let's switch to something that's really easy, like cancer pain. And so this isn't unusual. Two out of this whole group do, do intrathecal pumps. I think that's a travesty. I think that's a crime. I think it's way underpenetrated because if you were to take, I'm going to switch to blame my own specialty for a while. So, uh, so Dr. Clerk and I are radiologists, and we deal a lot with cancer pain. A lot of our, some of our specialty do only cancer pain, interventional oncologic procedures. And there's about 1.5 million people that have cancer every year. About a third of these will have uh, severe pain, and about a third of those will have a life expectancy greater than three months. But this, by definition, means they're, they're a good uh, patient for um, a pain pump. And as we know, uh, pursuant to what I mentioned earlier, uh, opioids and the overprescribing of these things, you know, I don't, I don't think we ever had justification for doing that. I'm sorry, but it wasn't, was never appropriate. I remember back in the early 2000s, opioid-induced hyperalgesia was a thing. Anytime you poke somebody with your finger, they would say, ow, when you're about ready to do a procedure, and you knew that they'd been on chronic narcotics, you can identify them, you can know, and you're making their pain worse, right? Opioids are not designed to be used chronically. You develop a, a tremendous tolerance, and you create a situation that makes them unfixable when paradoxically trying to help them with their pain. And this has resulted in lots of opioid deaths. And the thing about opioid deaths now is that prescription opioid deaths are way down. The non-prescription or illicit opioid deaths are way up. But that originally was triggered and fostered by the prescription of opioids. And you could do it in a bunch of different ways. You can give opioids uh, a shot, transmuscular. You could do it transdermal with a patch. You could do it with a pill. You can do it IV. All of of these are systemic opioid. The non-systemic opioid or the targeted drug delivery is intrathecal. Just like we have a blood-brain barrier, we have a barrier between the CSF and the, uh, the, what's extrathecal. We put it in the CSF. We put it right by the pain uh, 
the, the dorsal columns and the rest of the, the neural network, the pain receptors that lie and are bathed by the CSF. And this is why it's called targeted drug delivery, because it targets the intrathecal space. And so intrathecal space, it turns out the pain uh, reduction and pain treatment, and these are based on three level one trials, uh, TJ Smith, uh, Peter Stotz, uh, Lisa Stearns, and this is better, much better pain reduction, much less toxicity in terms not only of toxicity of side effects, but toxicity in general, and the survival. If We know that in interventional oncology, if you take care of the patient's pain, you make them more comfortable, you automatically increase their survival. And we know from targeted drug delivery, th this is much safer than systemic narcotics. This is about one to 100 in narcotic na non-naive patients. So if you have somebody that's on 100 milligrams of intrathecal, or sorry, 100 milligrams of morphine orally, it's about the same as one milligram of intrathecal morphine. And narcotic naive patients, it's about a one to 300 ratio. So this is utilization data. So pumps are expensive. I got that. Not as expensive as stimulators. In fact, they're about half the price of stimulators. And it turns out that treating patients for their pain based on whatever you do, whatever you do for pain, and it's primarily medication-based, that the crossover point is about seven months, this shy of eight months. And so the medication curve continues to go up. The pump say static for uh, seven years and you change out the battery, pop the hood and change the battery every seven years and this stays stable. And this is measured, this is uh, good work by the late great Lisa Stearns that measured this at all points from the ER to outpatient to inpatient, all points of healthcare service delivery. And so to focus again on our, my radiology colleagues, this is so you can do the diagnosis, you can do the biopsy of the tumor, you could put uh, chemo port in when you bi biopsy it to be a malignant lesion. You could do ablations, you could do uh, taste, Y90, other embolizations, but you leave out the best thing in the world to take care of the patient's pain is a pump. And this is by far the best thing that we do for cancer. Just confining it to cancer is one of the six things that we really know that it, it's excellent for. So this involves just pocket creation. Uh, we do this with a bunch of different devices, including spinal cord stimulators. Uh, and we tunnel from the, the catheter placement, we tunnel it to the pocket, connect it, and then um, we refill electronic analysis, reprogramming, and maintain that pump over the course of the next seven years. So I want you to look at this list. Do you ever see patients that have severe spasticity? I think some of you guys do, some of you guys don't. Do you ever see patients with cancer pain? You ever see patients that have non-surgical pain? Think of the 80-year-old uh, female primarily with degenerative scoliosis. Do you ever see those patients? You ever see patients with multi-site pain, neck and low back pain, neck, mid-back, low back pain, peripheral neuropathy? You ever see patients with arachnoiditis? I don't see them very often, but I see one or two a year. And the only common thing is the arachnoiditis has been missed. These are very apparently difficult to diagnose. People don't look at the cauda equina and see the clumping of the nerve roots. I think we do, don't we, Dr. Clerk? And uh, it seems to be it maybe it's just the train. He's an interventional neuroradiologist, loves the cauda equina, and is able to pick up arachnoiditis. And I think uh, other people can. Once in patients that are unable, that are on high dose oral opioids that are unable to reduce this. So does anybody see these patients? Yes. You, if you don't, they see you, and they see you every day or almost every day. These are not uncommon scenarios, especially the multi-site pain, degenerative scoliosis. This is a PSR registry data. Um, this is uh, comparing pumps and stimulators. Uh, bottom line for the PSR registry, about at the end of life for a stimulator, about 60% of the patients want to have their stimulator battery replaced or some portion of their system to make it work again. Out of 831 pumps, only four patients elected not to have them replaced. Out of the four, one had no pain, one had an infection at the site and couldn't have it replaced. So you have two patients. That's a replacement rate of 99.6% of people wanted to have their pump replaced. That's the best example that I know of about how effective this therapy is. 
and in clinical practice, this is exactly exactly my experience. So why do we have the cognitive dissonance of some clinical conditions that are very common and we have very few people putting pumps in? Well, I think it's a combination of things. This cognitive dissonance can really be explained by historical factors. So we've had past misuse of pumps and orals. So right when pumps came out, people thought we well, we do intrathecal and we do we combine that with oral and that seemed to be better for pain control. Let me tell you a little story. We had a guy that was back in the day, this was uh, 2017, he came in on 1,200 milligram equivalents of oral morphine a day. That's just insanity, by the way. But nevertheless, he, you know, he wanted to come in for a pump trial. And I told him, you know, this is very unlikely to work for you. Very unlikely. He was insisted. So using the 1 to 100 ratio, uh, I usually give one milligram of intrathecal morphine or equivalent for every 100 milligrams taken by mouth. So that would have translated into 12 milligrams of intrathecal morphine. And I, and I asked my fellow, well, what do you think? What, what should we do? He said, well, we're not going to give him 12. And I said, absolutely not. I mean, why? You know, nobody, that's insanity for him to be on that much. We don't want to double down on the insanity by giving 12 milligrams of intrathecal. So I, I, I settled on eight. Do you know how I settled on eight? Maybe like this, eight seems okay. So I gave him a, a, a bolus dose of eight milligrams of intrathecal morphine, enough to kill this entire row right here. So what do you think happened to him? He stopped breathing. No, he didn't stop breathing. He did fine. And he did, was pain-free for two hours. On hour three, the pain started to come back. Hour four, he was angry and checked out AMA. So this is an example about if you give somebody systemic narcotics, where is that digested? Where is it uh, metabolized? It's metabolized in your liver, primarily by the cytochrome P450 enzyme. It turns out this is an amazing enzyme. I mean, there's nothing you can do almost to overcome it. This guy was taking orally enough oral opioids to, you know, to supply this whole room for pain control post-op every day. So it, it, he had smooth endoplasmic reticulum from here to the sun and back. I mean, his, his cytochrome P450 was, you know, running like a sub two hour marathon. And so there's no amount of this. And if you mix orals with pump, the pump can't overcome it. It doesn't have time. You put it intrathecally, it doesn't get systemic. It's metabolized systemically, but it's metabolized also by the liver. It will eventually become sy systemic and it will be metabolized by the liver and it will go away. And if you give somebody this amount of any, any type of systemic narcotic, you will short circuit the effectiveness of the pump by increasing the metabolism that will make it inevitably ineffective. So don't do that. Um, tradition. I've heard a numerous of my colleagues say, don't do pumps, I don't like pumps. Anybody that says that is exactly the same person as saying, don't do kyphoplasty. It doesn't work. You know, magic, miracles, and kyphoplasty, not necessarily in that order. It's not one of the best things we do. It's the best thing that's done in terms of immediate pain relief, right? And so anybody that says it doesn't work doesn't do it. And I can bank on that. Anybody that says they don't like pumps doesn't do it to any significant degree. Doesn't do it to him or has no knowledge about how to do it. So they say you're married to the patient. That's another trope that's just repeated over time. And I can tell the person that says these words doesn't do pump and they're listening to somebody else. What does that mean? I mean, uh, Dr. David, if one of your patients that you hadn't seen 15 years ago came back to say, oh, you know, I have acute sciatica, would you see him? What if he needed two or three injections? Would you see him? What if you needed to do something else? Maybe perk discectomy? Yeah. Well, we don't want to be married to that patient. Hold on. <laughs> So what does that mean? I mean, I, I see people that, I have, that I've, been, I've been in practice a couple of decades, and I see people routinely over and over again. I see also patients I haven't seen for a while. I mean, I don't know what that means, and I don't, don't like the term. Um, this means that the generation of people who don't do pumps are telling the next generation of people don't do pumps based on zero experience. 
And you talk, but the, the opposite is if you see people who do a lot of pumps, they love them. So you can always tell the experienced people because they like it. Um, pumps are complicated or complex. I've heard both terms. These are not synonyms. Complicated and complex are not the same thing, right? Complex are things that are complicated, but you can, as long as you know the rules, you can kind of work through it. Complicated are things that are unpredictable, right? Complex is a jet engine. Complex is our tax law. My wife is complicated. So there's a difference between these two. We have some people that put in pumps and some people that manage pumps. We do both. And I think the separation of the people who put them in versus the people who manage them, sometimes you know, problems are delayed to get fixed. Sometimes, oh, it's, it's the person managing your pump. That's why uh, your, the pump's not working for you. Oh, it's the person that installed it. You need a catheter and rotor, so it's, and it's, something's wrong. With so I think bringing these two together, manage them and install, troubleshoot, electronic analysis, reprogramming, catheter and rotor studies, do it all. Put, a, put these things together. And one of the things that's really interesting, it's not worth my time. I've heard this a lot. It's not worth my time. So this is CPT code list. Turns out that we're reimbursed for everything that we do, including the patient visit and every other factor of the pump placement and management that I just mentioned. Everything that we do. And here are the numbers of reimbursement. You have year one, which includes the, the placement, and you have years two through seven that include uh, refills, electronic analysis and reprogramming, catheter and rotary studies. So for every patient, it's worth $2,587. And it took time to add all this up. These are accurate figures. And this is, this is from my area. I'm in the same uh, Medicare carrier as um, Chad Stevens, no, we're Novitas. And does anybody know what this is? We have anybody here with an MBA? Should have known. <laughs> Present value of future cash flow. That's, this is something they teach you in MBA school, and here's the way it's calculated. So if we have the present value, what's valuable now in terms of future cash flow, if you're, let's say we're, we'll eliminate year one, and we'll just, we'll just go to year two. Year two, you remember what year two was? You remember what the value per year of year two to year seven was? $2,587, okay? So let's say you manage, you start off managing pump or two, let's say, you know, Gavin's up in Alaska and, and he's he's got, you know, 20 pumps and pretty soon after three or four years, he goes to a couple of hundred pumps. And so if we were to take this, the value of the $2,587 all the way out through the rest of the lifespan of that pump, using this formula, it would give you $15,000 per patient. Using a couple of hundred patients, this is your present value of future cash flow. So is that worth your time? The answer should be yes. Um, if not, then you're playing in a different league than I think all the rest of us. But that is definitely worth your time. So we've reviewed all these, how to incorporate targeted drug delivery, the principle of the inverse pyramid clicking down, starting with the least invasive thing, uh, and ending up with the combination of the least invasive thing that helps patients. These are, I can think of six categories, and these are categories that, that, that are mine, they're, they're my original thoughts. I've also written a book about this, and they're in the book. And it's uh, incorporated these, if you're not doing pumps, you're not adequately taking care of each one of these six categories. And then the strengths, the economic situation. So targeted drug delivery is just a natural extension of both benign care and both oncologic care, and very much a natural extension for certain subspecialties. It's highly effective, very sustainable, and very profitable. And I think this is absolutely essential to anybody who wants to be a pain practitioner to take care of being interventional pain, be a minimally invasive treater. This is absolutely essential if you're going to be 
uh, someone that takes care of the cross-sectional spectrum of these patients. Thank you very much.